um, technical difficulties with slides, so I'm going to go out without the slides. Uh, so you can enjoy this. This is Grand Rapids. This is where I hail from. Um, and welcome. So my name is Josh Francisco. Um, the title of this talk is Hitting the Pavement with Python. Um, and just a little bit about myself first uh, before I get into it. Um, I work for a company called Bloomadora. We write monitoring solutions for enterprise-y things. Um, mostly VMware stuff, but we're branching out. Uh, we have like a database monitoring uh, service uh, as well. So um, I got my start in Python um, by just kind of necessity. Um, started working uh, with like bash scripts and stuff like that when I started working at Bloomadora a lot. And so naturally as you evolve in, from, a, in, you know, from scripting, you move on to like real languages, a lot more robust, things like that. So um, I started out as an intern, uh, then I was a QA engineer for a while, and now um, I'm DevOps. So um, Python is becoming more and more uh, a part of my everyday life, basically. Um, and that's not just at work, uh, that's at home too. So the project I'm presenting to you guys is um, a personal project of mine that's all done in my free time. So, um, so the uh, only reason I'm here is uh, a friend of mine just was like, hey, give this talk at the local Python users group. And so I did that, and he's like, you should submit it to Pi Ohio. And I'm here. So <laughs> uh, I did not actually expect for the talk to even get accepted. So thank you. Um, uh, the project started originally in Ruby. Um, that was an experience. So after experiencing Ruby, uh, my friend Dan, he's in the audience, was like, hey, you should try Python. And Python just worked for me. Um, just something about writing Python was a lot easier for me to wrap my head around because um, I don't have um, a software background. I was a machinist before I got into Bloomadora. So I was in manufacturing and things like that. So um, it was a lot easier for my machinist brain to take in Python than it was to take on like whatever Ruby is. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, today actually marks the public release of my project, so you guys can check it out. There is, unfortunately, a little bit of hardware dependency uh, because of the nature of what I'm doing. But um, so uh, this is an aftermarket engine management controller. So if you modify engines up to a certain point, the factory computer can no longer compensate for what that is doing. Um, so eventually, it makes sense to move to something more robust. Um, some controllers you can reprogram, and that's fine. Uh, these controllers are unique in that they're very generic. So I can apply this same controller to different engines of makes and models, cylinder configurations, everything. So um, what that means is I have the same set of tools and approaches to every single project I do with this. So sort of the open source-y uh, Linux -y version of fuel injection. Um, the factory application is in its own right very good. You know, to interact with it and do tuning and everything like that. Um, great application. Uh, there's a paid for version that unlocks more features and can do more of the things that I'm doing, but um, it's still all just communicating with it through the serial bus. So if you can figure out how to talk to it over the serial bus, you can do all the other things that you couldn't normally do without buying the software. Which, it's worth buying it and all right, but um, where I'm going with this is the factory tools logging um, is not very good. It's not very fast, and it outputs to a tab delimited text file, um, and you can't really do a lot with that in real time. Because um, you'd be trying to read from a file while it's being written to constantly. And that just smells bad no matter how you look at it. Um, the application is also this big, heavy Java application, which is great because I can run that application on Linux. It's really cool that there's a tool like that that is completely cross-platform. You know, 
Windows, OS X, Linux, and you can tune your engine on any of those. So, um, uh, so engine management controllers are pretty cool little devices. Um, they're actually more akin to an oscilloscope. Um, they measure all these sensors and equipment on the machine operating in real time. And you know we're used to, in Python and Webland, dealing with millisecond latencies. You know, um, my code is still you know, operating in that realm of speed, but the controller itself is operating in micro and nanoseconds as far as how it's looking at the engine. It's very, very high speed. So the closer we can get down to that micro and nanosecond uh, range as far as like monitoring, we can get a lot more resolution out of our data. Um, eventually, you just get too much, right? Um, but I digress. So wake up. Uh, so what, why you want to gather data like this is it serves as an objective tool for making changes, right? You make a change, you can see that change, how it's reflected in either like gas mileage or performance or you know, whatever thing that you want. So um, I focus on taking all that data, gathering it, and stuffing it into a database so I can look at it and do stuff with it later on. Um, because when you're driving a car, you can't really be looking at <laughs> all this data coming in in real time because you'll run into things. So uh, it's a good idea to save it. Um, and it, you can also look and compare, you know, um, you know, like a pass at a drag strip. You can compare multiple passes um, throughout the day and you can see, oh, as the air temperature drops, the car starts to get faster from these sort of things. Um, now you can see that in your, your time slip at the drag strip, but what you'll be able to see, um, and I'll show you here in a second, is um, you get a lot more resolution. You can see where you were gaining the most performance in a specific spot. And maybe you gained overall, but maybe the engine was actually accelerating slower at a certain point, and, but your time slip won't reflect that 500 RPM window, right? So uh, PyEFI is the name of my program. Um, it's a high-speed data collection display and analytics platform. So this right here is actual real-time data coming from this controller on the desk right now. It's coming in uh, 28 times per second right now, uh, depending on some uh, parameters and things like that, you can up the collection rate even faster. I, no, this, okay, so we'll talk a little bit about my rig here. Yeah, no, that's good. Um, so the controller needs to see an engine doing something in order to generate like RPM data, right? Because that's rotations per minute. So I don't have an engine running on the table, obviously, because we'd all be dying of carbon monoxide poisoning. <laughs> One sec here. So what I have is an Arduino that uh, is a signal generator, basically. So it's generating a square wave signal that represents what an engine would be outputting, right? So that, um, once you configure it with the, the tuning programs, because um, there's, there's different trigger wheels that determine um, position on the crankshaft and things like that. So you could have a single blip for every rotation, right? That would make sense. Well, some of these trigger wheels have like 32 teeth on them. And with a square wave signal, that's not 32 measurements, that's 64 measurements because of the up and down every single time. So you, get, you can get tons and tons of resolution. So what that means is the computer can see if the engine's accelerating or decelerating in a lot more precise of a manner. Um, that's kind of outside the scope of this talk a little bit, but uh, still interesting, right? Um, so one of the reasons I ended up using Redis for all this is pure speed. Um, when I first started writing this, I was using Postgres because everyone uses Postgres. Um, but what I found out is in my main collection loop right here, it's just 
over and over and over, uh, when I was writing to Postgres, that interaction was taking long enough. It was affecting my collection rate by like five or ten times per second. So I was having to do async, you know, to fire the data off somewhere else, let Postgres actually put it in the database. Um, so once uh, I actually kind of fell into Redis on accident, um, Blue Medora was writing uh, a monitoring product for Redis at the time. So I got to use it, and I was like, this is awesome. And it actually happens to be way, way, way easier to use than SQL. Um, it's really, really easy command line, right? So um, you can even write to Redis from Bash if you want to, like in Bash scripts. You don't have to use like the Redis CLI or anything like that if you don't want to. Um, so uh, how many of you are familiar with NoSQL stuff at all? A few? Okay, so NoSQL data stores, uh, it's usually like key value kind of stuff. Um, Redis happens to translate really well to how you would normally code in Python. So you can, you're used to working with key value pairs all the time. That's bread and butter stuff. So it just translates really nicely into Redis. You're not having to write select statements and things like that. But the downside to that is you don't get some of the relationship, the relational goodies, but you just have to create that relation, relational stuff on your own. So um, as collections are coming in, um, I basically store them in a what's called a Redis hash. So the first collection comes in, that is saved into a Redis key, which is different from your normal key value pairs. Um, so and then so Redis key would be like collection, right? Um, I don't have it displayed right here, but it's similar to this, right? So this would be your Redis key, and then um, spot one on the hash for your first collection, and then the result, and then the second one, and so on, over and over and over, and that constantly increments. And as you can see, you don't have an idea of time of when that came in, right? So what you do is at the same time that you're putting that data in, you write to a, a separate uh, list in Redis with that index, one, two, three, four, and the time that it happened. So now if I need to get like, you know, 60 seconds, the last 60 seconds worth of data, I query something else that gives me the list of indexes, and then I can pull those indexes out of the, the main hash. So make sure that stays awake. Where am I at on my slides? So yeah, Redis was a, a big godsend that really enabled this to be as fast as it is. Um, right now, what you're seeing, um, again from Redis, is a pub-sub mechanism in Redis. So if you can kind of think of, think of it as chat rooms, but they're one directional. So this collector process here, uh, well actually I'll back up a little bit. How many of you know what Tmux is? This is Tmux. So everything is sort of microservices architecture in here. So I just use Tmux as like my little environment to fire up everything I need to run all at the same time. So um, Tmux works really great for what I'm doing here. Um, where was I going? Where was I? Forgot. Um, yes, pub sub, pub sub, yes, okay. Um, so as a collection comes in, I save it and I index it and I do all those things and then I also publish it to our, the Redis pub sub channel, if you will. Um, so then this is the display side and that just receives that pub sub message. So I'm not actually going into the database and checking for the latest record. It's just getting it sent to it automatically. So I'm sure you guys are thinking of like, oh, that's really cool. There's lots of little inter-process communication things you can do with that. And, and there is. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a really simple mechanism. Um, it's not two-way though. So you can't confirm a result like out of the box. I can't say that, oh yeah, I got that back. You'd have to set up another pub sub in the other direction 
and write your own sort of handling for that, right? Um, so the display side of this, as you notice, I kind of went for like a retro sort of look, right? Um, everything's done um, all completely in shell and Python. There's no other crazy display libraries or anything like that. The, the colorization stuff, I wrote all that. That's uh, in the repo. Um, I'll pull that up too. Um, and that is basically, there's a, a list of colors. And depending on the range, I just pick the one at the top or the bottom or in the middle. And you set the range, as you can see down here. This is sort of defining what a dashboard is. So this right here is health. So we got battery voltage, coolant temp, and we got another coolant right here. So this is actually three columns. It just sort of looks like two. Um, so this is uh, voltage right now. Um, so 14.7 volts. I'm not handling decimals very well in this yet, but um, you get the idea. So um, the bar mechanism was kind of fun to write. So check this out. It reacts very fast. You guys can come check this out in a minute and play with it. But, and I also have a little potentiometer up here. And it's, it's very responsive. It's, it's instant. There's very little latency as far as what is actually happening to display time on the screen. I haven't figured out a way to accurately measure it. So if anyone has ideas on that, that'd be great. It'd just be nice to know what sort of latency I was seeing on the screen, how old that data was. Because um, right now, I can't tell. <laughs> but it's still very, very quick. Um, so do you guys have any questions? Um, I kind of just wanted to cruise through my spiel really quick and see if you guys had questions or like other ideas and stuff for me. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, yeah, that would, that would probably work. So he, said, he suggested to have a button uh, and drop something on it and then have a camera to measure that latency. That's not a bad approach. Um, anyone else got questions? So this is, this is all print, print statements. <laughs> this is all print statements. Um, and then uh, I do the, uh, uh, what is it, ANSI escape sequences to jump in and out of colors and things like that. But this, this is all just print statements. I, there's no crazy colorization library here. So I'll tell you a little bit of a trick on how to, I got it to do this, because it looks really cool, doesn't it? <laughs> So what I do is I print two lines. So I print this line, and then new line, and then I print this line. But then I tell the cursor just to return back to the beginning. So you can see the cursor here. So what, it gives the illusion that this is static at the bottom, but it's actually just printing over it every single time. <laughs> yeah. So right now, we're doing it 30 times per second. My system I have at home does it 45 times per second. Um, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just, it's all print statements. It's all very core, basic Python. I'm only using the Redis library. Um, I'm trying to think what else. I hate curses. <laughs> it's, it's some sort of cruel joke that they call it curses. It really is. Like, it, for some things, it's probably better, like, to be honest. Like, it does handle like, uh, drawing of like, basic you know, boxes and things like that a lot better. But one day, it just clicked to me. The stuff I wanted to do with it, I could do with Tmux. You know what I mean? Which gives me the boxes and the isolation, which I would have had to do in curses, and it'd be all weird and abstract. 
for this, uh, the, one of the libraries I'm using is tmuxp, which is a Python tmux wrapper. So you configure this dashboard with a YAML, which I can show you guys. Oh, well, this is the dashboard config YAML. Um, I'll cover this real quick. So uh, in Redis, there's a concept of a sorted set. Um, so this would be the like score of the dashboard. And then this would be the actual dashboard dashboard string. So I just pull this into Python split. I expect it to be the same number of elements every single time. It's really simple stuff. Um, but I'll show you the tmux stuff. So, uh, yeah, this is tmuxp. Really easy wrapper for tmux. Um, it's, you can see what it's doing right there. Um, so for my command structure, um, I'm using this library called Python Fire. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty crazy library. It lets you expose a class and its methods to the CLI directly. Sorry, sorry, we're gonna, we're gonna pivot here for a second. So, so can you, you guys can't really see that, can you? you got, yeah, all right. I know that font's so easy to read, right? <laughs> so this is what Fire does. So this is my pipeline class, the initial like bootstrapping into my CLI. So all I do is expose like I pass this class into fire and it just takes care of this for me. So these are the methods within pipeline. So then if I go to the next one, these are the methods for that method, which that method uh, dash just returns a class. So, nope. Nope. It does it. Automatic. Super magic. So then like add, oh, that tell, like those are the parameters directly. Like I don't, there's no guesswork. I don't have to deal with parsing arguments ever. It just does it for you. It's really awesome. If anyone does any CLI stuff, I highly recommend it. Yep, Python Fire, yep. Uh, Google wrote it actually, um, super, super handy. Super, super handy. Um, it's one of my bread and butter ones. Yeah. Okay, so you got your uh, engine control module and you're just talking via serial to Slapka? Yep. Okay. Yep. So what would it take to like swap out, say, an RMA and get some sensors attached to it? Um, so that it would kind of be up to you how you want to get the data to like to the dashboard part, right? So um, so from an Arduino, there's, you have a couple different routes with an Arduino. I'm using my Arduino as a signal generator for the engine control module. I'm not talking to the Arduino or getting data from it. It's, it's just there, yes. So um, you can pull up a serial interface with an Arduino though. So you can gather data from an Arduino that way. So it'd be the same kind of thing that I'm doing, um, just you'd have to write, you know, code yourself around the Arduino's parameters, right? So um, that, that's one option. Um, otherwise, if it's something more like a Raspberry Pi, right, uh, the way my dashboard stuff is working, uh, the way this stuff is working, these are just key value pairs that I'm passing into this, uh, this display process. So this dashboard config right here, key, 
what I want it to print as. That's why it says temp here and not coolant, because coolant is too long. And then shiny is like the display parameter, and these are ranges and things like that. And then anyone recognize these guys? What are they? From the YAML. They're from the YAML, but more specifically, anyone? It's a Python thing. Yeah, it's Python string formatting. So I'm just plopping that in to do the string formatting, and it justifies it left or right or center. Yeah. <laughs> I'm lazy. <laughs> I don't need to write justification. They've already taken care of it. So um, yeah, uh, what else can we talk about? Uh, so serial data is fun to deal with. Um, what's really interesting um, about this controller is I can send it different commands and get different results back. I'm not doing any of that yet. So this controller, I send it the letter A. That's all I send it. And then it sends me back 212 bytes of just data. It's not, it doesn't, it's not JSON. It's not ready to go. It's not pretty. Um, but I know what that result looks like. Um, Every single time, yep. So uh, this is the configuration for that byte stream. So this is the position. Now, so like these, these are like set bits, like on off switches. I'm just collecting them as a whole as an unsigned 8-bit integer. So. Um, if you didn't have this, you would have literally no idea what you were looking at. I mean, you could start guessing by, I mean, because there's only uh, six possibilities for like the orientation as far as like signed or unsigned, eight, 16, or 32 bits. Question? So this uh, is actually defined uh, by the controller's firmware. So uh, this is the actual config from the controller, and I just parsed it in and did useful stuff with it. So yes? So it's pretty standardized. Um, now I, could, I can reprogram the controller so that the A command will send back a different arrangement of this. So I, I coded into this configuration on purpose because I wanted it to be future proof for like if they you know update the firmware and change this um, I wanted to be able to, you know to use it so um, so this has anyone dealt with byte streams at all in Python not a lot that's that's okay because it sucks but um, so you use pack and unpack to do that um, you'll have to look into it but basically, I have to build a character string that represents the orientation of these signed and unsigned 8, 16, and 32-bit integers um, to unpack the 212 bytes. And then on top of it, um, because they were forward thinking and serial communications isn't perfect and it's, uh, it's susceptible to noise and things like that, especially in an automotive environment, um, cars produce tons of electromagnetic interference. Tons and tons of it. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever been in a car and the radio has a weird buzz that seems to be attached to the engine. That's what you're hearing is electromagnetic interference. So, um, so there's a CRC32 cycle redundancy check that you can verify that you did indeed get a good packet back, basically. So I checked that. Um, I haven't, uh, I think the only times I haven't gotten one back is when I didn't know what I was doing yet. <laughs> but um, I ha I, we were testing this on this laptop here. And I had never run it on this laptop until last night. And I was getting some weird controller problems and things like that. Whereas this machine's fine for some reason. So I think it has something to do with like uh, either the state of the serial device when it's come up or 
the Linux kernels or something like that. How are we doing on time? Okay. Anyone else? What else we got? Yeah, so his, his uh, statement was, uh, how would you handle logging to an outside Redis? Um, for that, I would probably want to have something to gather up a bunch of it and just quickly dump it, because I don't think the internet would handle this, this rate of exchange, right? The, the, it's, there's quite a bit of latency, comparatively speaking, sending it over the internet, making sure the request got sent, and then sending another one back to back. And if, I guess you could do that asynchronous, asynchronously, right? But if that was in a blocking loop, you probably couldn't hit 40 or 50 times per second on a normal internet connection, right? That's kind of my thinking. So to, to save it to the, the cloud or something, I'd probably just have something to dump it um, in a larger packet to another Redis database, or maybe Postgres or something, right? Uh, something more suited for uh, archiving. Yeah. Um, so I let this run for eight hours overnight, and it was like two or three gigabytes of memory. I mean, it's it's trivial. It's you know 212 bytes, and I'm not even being uh, smart with the data I'm saving. Uh, I'm saving the, the, the raw data that I get back. So this is what the raw data looks, back, looks like when it comes back. Um, it's not a byte string. Python, when I printed this, converted it to um, whatever it wanted to. But uh, so, so I'm saving that and than this <laughs> along with it, which is that just deconstructed into like human readable form. I'm not even being smart about how I'm saving it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I mean, you could, yeah. Um, there's even some additional things you can do with Redis and um, different data types that you could probably get it down to storing even less because like right now, there's uh, certain parameters that are just always like zero, right? So you're saying saving zero, 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 zero. Well, if you could dedupe that, you could save even more space. You know, so if I extracted this out and sort of did, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, like a, a delta sort of situation, I could save even, save even more space. What's that? Use. Oh, yeah. Um, so he said yeah, I could use Zlib to compress it. Um, I could do that in Redis. That is a possibility. Redis will just do that for you if you want it to. Um, there's a CPU hit. I haven't been worried about space yet, so I haven't looked into these, these possibilities. Yeah. Yeah, so let's check that out. Well, it's not running now. That's not going to work. <laughs> so granted, this is a quad-core MacBook. But CPU usage is still very, very reasonable. Uh, under uh, around 10%, let's just say. Uh, I'm not sure how much of that is top and, and whatnot. but. Yeah, yeah, um, and that, that was another reason uh, what he was saying is you, if you cut the display, you could save even more CPU, and that was another reason I went with sort of the microservice sort of architecture is, um, is CPU performance and things like that. So if, when it is in a car, I could have a Pi using almost no electricity just, just running and collecting, and I don't have to have full-blown hardware in a, you know, in a car. Because um, 
Uh, the car environment is a really tricky place to put a computer, and it's not just space considerations. Uh, you have to think about temperature swings. Uh, you know, we're Midwesterners, so it gets below freezing every single year, and it gets pretty hot in the summer. You have a really wide range of temperature fluctuations to deal with, and average consumer hardware isn't built to handle that range, right? Then you also have vibration. Um, you know, your, your Sunday driver car is nice and comfy and doesn't have a lot of vibration, but, you know, uh, like a high revving Honda that goes to 8,000 RPM, that's it, singing, the whole car is vibrating, you know, and that does fatigue electronics. I mean, that is a real thing. The boards can vibrate and the traces can come apart over long times. Yeah? No, so uh, his uh, observation was, does the display limit my collection rate? Uh, because they're decoupled and I'm using Redis pub sub, if the display for, and for some reason can't catch up, what will happen is the pub sub queue will just grow while the collection is still going as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. What's going on in the engine? Like, compared to the other products you're using for the commercial, do you feel like you have a better understanding of what is happening in real time with this? Yeah, so the, the light version of the product collected at 15 times per second. Okay. You know, and at my, in my lab setup at home, I'm getting close to 50. Gotcha. Um, and here I'm doing about 30, so I'm still, you know, in a less than ideal situation, I'm still doubling what I had with the factory tool, and it's way more flexible, uses less resources and, and everything. Yes? <laughs> yeah, I'll put the slides up um, on PyOhio and stuff like that so you guys can go through and uh, like absorb them. I had some interesting uh, metrics around like the speed of Redis. So off the top of my head, like setting a key in Redis takes three microseconds and getting it takes one microsecond. Um, it's, so I mean there was little tidbits like that in there, but I've covered most of the stuff I wanted to get to. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so eventually um, I could have code, I could code some logic into this and say, um, I, I don't know exactly what the situation would be, but I could tell the controller to do something. Um, perhaps make tuning adjustments, fine adjustments and things like that. Um, that is a very real possibility. Um, it's just a matter of you know, communicating with it and telling it to do what you need it to. Um, yeah, anything else? Um, yeah, I, check out the repo. Um, I can't show it on the screen because my slides are busted. But if you just search PyEFI on GitHub, PyEFI, it'll come up. Um, it, there's probably little sections of my code that would be useful to just about everyone in this room. I mean, it's just kind of like a whole bunch of tools I stack together to do something useful to me. You know, like the display side of this could easily be retrofitted to, like this, this could be ping times or some sort of server health or something. And you could just use the colorization library that I've got here. You know, or it could be something you hooked into an Arduino and you're getting a temperature from a room, you know, and you're just updating it every 10 or 15 seconds, you know, and you could just stream that to here. Um, you can see, you know, like this, I didn't really touch on this, but this dashboard configuration um, updates live from here. So the configuration for this is stored in Redis. Every time I get a new request in on the PubSub channel, 
I check the configuration, I pull that down, and update this. So if I remove one of these, it just drops out. You know, or if I add one, it just appears. And because it's in a sorted set, I can put something sandwiched in between here if I want to. You know, um, so again, something that's probably useful to just about everyone in here. Anybody else? Time's up. So if you guys want to check this out up here uh, for a minute, you can touch it and look at it. Uh, feel free. I'm going to hang out for a few minutes, but we got a long ride home. So uh, thank you for your time. <laughs>